Hi there, you're listening to Unnatural Selection, the show about newsy type stuff and things. My name is George. And my name is Adam. And with our powers combined, we are Unnatural Selection. Make sure you visit us at our salubrious home on the web, unnaturalshow.com. Now, I noticed just then, Adam, you had a very wry look on your face. Well, what, that's because... To what I'm can I attribute to, that? Trying to be a bit impressive. You know, just trying to make the, start the video with, with something a little bit cool, like mm-hmm. catching a ball without looking at it. Mm, um, so cool. But, um, so cool. Like, it's so cool. obviously what people come here to, to watch mm-hmm. and listen to. 100%. Is uh, our antics. Um, minus Tom today, who uh, unfortunately was killed by his computer. Mm, was um, killed by a, a severe bout of epilepsy, which is almost true. Um, almost true. So uh, our good friend Tom, as we mentioned last week, um, was doing his part for the gaming with the uh, gaming for the globe charity. Um, so he was streaming live over 20 hours yesterday, playing various video games in order to raise money for the globe theater in London. Against all health advice. Again, yeah, again, against all health advice. Um, but that's how much he loves theater. God damn it. So I think they raised a fair bit in the end. When uh, I clocked off sometime last night in the, in the wee hours in the morning, that was, um, uh, close to two thousand pounds that had been yeah, raised. So, uh, but that was like the end of that cycle, and then there were other cycles. The goal was to raise five thousand pounds. That's um, many pounds. So, um, I, I myself donated um, a, a very modest sum uh, in order to to help the, keep the effort going. And uh, so, it was good to good to see and and good to see you know people really responding to what Tom was doing and donating during the stream and and stuff like that as well. So, well done you. Yes. Yes. And he's currently in bed now, I think. Yeah, so that's out. why he's not um, like currently on the show is because he uh, was up till 5 a.m. in the morning last he's night. He's in bed, not dead, as mm. it were. Um, but meanwhile, the world goes on, uh, as, as it were. And as uh, George mentioned, probably in the uh, the Facebook uh, headline for the show. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, just a bit of a spike, just a bit of a second wave happening in Victoria at the moment. Is it a yeah. second wave if the first wave never really stopped well i mean that's what waves are aren't they you know like there's never ever like really just a, a continuous session it's, it's just you know wave upon wave it's you know? more of a stream the way you describe it rather than a wave. yeah a babbling brook of coronavirus a tidal wave <laughs> i don't know i mean have you ever been to the beach like you know and you dive under the wave and you think oh this is great you know i'll get up and just be able to take a breath you take you get up and then all of a sudden you just hit in the face with the next wave that's what's happened that's literally I, what has happened i assume the direction story. you were taking that sentence was have you ever been to the beach dived under the wave and wanted to keep on swimming uh for the rest of your the remainder of your short life and yes the answer to both of those questions is yes i have been both hit in the wave hit in the face by a wave as well as suffered existential angst while looking at the vastness of the ocean it's scary it's a scary scary place to be it's good that um, i live near the beach <laughs> gotta face your fears george mm-hmm. you know sometimes for hours them. a day <laughs> um uh, but yeah so like i i i don't want to have to everything to go backwards again so for everyone of, that's uh, lockdowns obviously listening to this show that, you know, has coronavirus, because um, <laughs> that's obviously people who know they've got coronavirus are, are spreading it because... No, for for those of you who are listening who have coronavirus, stop it. Stop it. <laughs> stop it. Stop it. Um, <laughs> um, I think part of the problem is obviously, as with, as with all uh, the way it's been, you know, up until now, is that people don't know they've got it and they assume mm. they're okay and it's not till it's too yeah. late depending on which reporting family. you look at they reckon sort of around potentially 15 percent of people are asymptomatic spreaders and then you've obviously got um issues with super spreaders as well um mm. which could could be anything from like genetic factors to um you, you know like um behavior or like maybe you've just got, like particularly talented at having an overly projectile projectilized cough and maybe you mm. just like you could just go to the cough Olympics and you're just one of the lucky ones that gets to spread it a lot. Um, <laughs> the thing that I find particularly infuriating here in Victoria, in Australia, we've had a number of new cases. Uh, I believe it was 41 overnight. 41 up from yesterday. Tw- yeah. 20 something just two, three days ago. So you, you do see the potential there for an exponential um, sort of increase in growth, which is quite concerning. Um, but um, hopefully... Uh, the the government's coronavirus app will uh, will save the day, as I'm sure. Oh, 
Look, we, we've got over millions of downloads now, so surely, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it'll, it'll start sending out data about, you know, who I've been in close contact with Mm -hmm. and uh, obviously will be the shield that we need in the darkest of the night. Oh, I'm just getting just a news alert coming through here. Uh, And yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. (laughs) Oh, what? Huh? You you mean the app that they spent millions of dollars developing and rolling out and heavily suggesting that people download for our own safety? It's fine. The Scotty from marketing said we could all go back to work if we all downloaded the COVID app. So basically... Um, the Australian government has turned into, uh, you know, a girl on Instagram trying to get you to go to her OnlyFans. Go on, just go, go on, just click, click the link. Go on, do it. <coughs> I've got a Patreon. <laughs> oh my god. Um, yeah, the the it it's it doesn't work for it. It doesn't, it doesn't not work. It doesn't, it doesn't not work. work but it also well. doesn't work. <laughs> so it's this, it's so it's okay. in the middle. So the federal government's COVID safe app has not identified any close contacts of a person infected with coronavirus who had not already been found through manual contact tracing, despite being downloaded by more than 6 million Australians in, uh, over the course of the last two months. So it, um, it has a number of problems with it, especially in regards to iPhones um, mm. And obviously here in Australia, uh, you know, iPhones are, you know, a particularly popular form of smartphone. Um, it, it essentially it sort of identified this article in the age identifies problems that were pretty apparent to me as an iPhone user mm. when using the app in that I had to open it up consistently, would see that it wasn't running, would need to relaunch it. Um, issues around, because Apple has this really... Um, well, certainly likes to maintain the line yeah. that they really respect people's privacy and they, you know, it's probably more for power usage reasons than anything else, but they have um, a, a really tight sort of software integration with their hardware because they make both the software and the hardware for their products. They can say, okay, well, um, in in situations where, you know, XYZ app is offline or isn't being used for more than a certain amount of time, we're going to restrict any power flowing through to that app it's it'll be there but it's essentially frozen and not really transmitting any data yeah. um there they've got this line about privacy so every now and then like maps or things like that use your location will prompt you every so often saying hey this uh, mm. app is still using you, your location do you want it to so a lot of those sort of restrictions are built into the apple ecosystem and yeah. have sort of exacerbated the um well the dismal the downloading problem. and then poor usage of said yeah. apps so they, they the issue, have issue picked up cases that, but yeah. it hasn't picked up any cases that we wouldn't have up, picked up through traditional contract tracing so there's, there's a great table that's been floating around and i'm assuming this it's got the australian government uh digital transformation agency uh stamped all over it but i'm sure that is yeah. a, just at the cutting edge of technology it's I'm literally sure. a spreadsheet from excel um <laughs> it, it is yeah, so for, for like it, it rates different phones and then the the operating system that runs those phones. And it's got a table of sort of whether or not the the you know the the, the transmission success rate is excellent. So that's a eighty to hundred, good fifty to eighty, moderate twenty five to fifty, or poor, which is twenty five and below. And there are a lot of them that you really want all of them to be excellent, right? So sure. the point being is if I, my phone's next to your phone that we're getting, you know at least 80% of the time, a data transfer Mm. that logs it. But most, like half the chart is is moderate or good. Um, And it basically just means that, you know, I could be standing next to you. So even if the phone is like working and you've got it unlocked, for instance, Mm. um, even if that is the case, you've only got a 50% chance of the data actually flowing back and forth between the devices. Good. How, is, many, look, how many million dollars did we spend on this? Two million dollars. Couple million. Two, That's fine. Two million. I mean, it's it's just Trump change, uh, or not? Yeah. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. In the um, in the scheme of things, in terms of how much money is being spent on, on various things, but I guess the focus that was put on it uh, was probably not warranted given its functionality. That being said, at the time, um, obviously a little bit different to where we're at now in the sense that they were trying to sort of explore all avenues and yeah, it was one um, of so many straws they were grasping at. Yes. Yeah. So look, and they had to roll it out quickly. It wasn't 
probably tested as much as you'd normally test one of these this sort of thing. So I get that we're going to have problems with this kind of thing. But um, my question is really, you know, do do you then go to Apple as the government, given there's now a spike of, of cases coming, do you go to Apple and say, you need to help us fix this problem? Or do you just write off I suspect... the whole thing as a lost cause because people's trust in the software has been lost? Yeah, I, I suspect that Apple as a large multinational organization with larger problems in its home country, um, probably has no time whatsoever for fucking Scott Morrison. Surely, surely they have an Australian division though, right? Sure, that, uh... but the, the thing that I don't think people really appreciate is that software is really hard. Like I've worked at a couple of different yeah. software companies and dealing with clients and whatnot. And, um, you know, a client would say, you know, I'd really like to request this feature, for example, XYZ feature. And, you know, a subsequent number of weeks later, that feature had had also been highlighted by a number of other people also using the software and so had gone through to the, to the developers and they'd built a, a new feature or, or created something to update it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that update had been coincidentally pushed out because it's cloud software within a sp- uh, the space of a few weeks of a client requesting something just like that. And they would say, oh, thanks, finally, developers got off their ass and you know, and pushed out the yeah. feature, like, thanks, George, for telling of that. And I'm like, you don't understand how software works. Like, they were working on that for months to push that feature out. It's just a coincidence. Like, yeah, you said that because yeah. a bunch of other people were also saying that, and that's why they prioritized it. But it's not like you said something to me, George, I went to the development team, and then they just fixed software. They just whipped it up. Just you know, whipped like it up. Like an ice cream sundae, just like pour yeah. it out. Would you like that as a chalk dip thing? Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> Do you want to flake yeah. in that or? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's not how software works. It's immensely complicated, works in a bunch of different concurrent systems, which all need to be optimized and tested before yeah. an update gets rolled out. It's a huge process. And if you change one thing, you don't know whether it's going to break something else. Exactly right. right. That's, the, that's the problem. And so, that's partly probably, probably the issue with this COVID safe app is that, you know, you don't really know how one sitting on one phone will affect the same thing will how that will translate to another operating system, another device. It's mm-hmm. you know, yeah. The good in. the good thing about iPhones is they are sort of remarkably consistent yeah. in that regard. Um, you do have a certain standards, um, a certain sort of hardware similarities across devices over you know a few different generations. Um, the problem with Android phones, of course, is that there's an, a completely unlimited scope as to like what constitutes an Android phone. It could be a Samsung, could be a Motorola, could be a Google phone. It could be a million different phones, all with different hardware, all with different requirements and, and, and things like that. So to get this stuff out is not easy to do. Um, and yeah, I think just people's expectations around what a piece of software is and does are not reasonable because they saw like the Facebook movie and like saw or, or they watched like two episodes of Silicon Valley and they just like hacked together Facebook in a night and people are like, oh yeah, I understand how software works. It's a bunch of nerds coding right, until 3 yeah. a.m. Like that's, he's, he's checked in, he's in the matrix, he's in the zone and then Facebook, I get it. <laughs> like I mean, that's that not how the said, sausage is made. Like, Why can't they just fix Call of Duty, George? I mean, I don't understand. It's been out for, a, you know, a couple of months now and I mm. still can't play a game of Warzone without the thing crashing because it's not optimized as well for my system. You got to um, install some fucking shaders, you idiot. It's all about the shaders. shaders. Um, so yeah, I should so yeah. probably check my privilege next time I complain about a video game. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a pretty good example of exactly what we highlighted when, when this app came out is like, aside from all the privacy concerns, is that it is just really difficult to get to to get a piece of technology like this together and roll mm. it out and also like uh, the australian Draw government eggs, <laughs> in particular has not been very is not notoriously well known for rolling out pieces of technology well like the census fuck up a couple of years ago is a famous example of of the, when the government tries to do the online um mm. and it, it hasn't worked well particularly in the past like Centering issues sure. like yeah. Um, so I don't know why we expected to get this right, but to to me it seemed like particularly obvious as they were spruiking it. They've got we've like me as an iPhone user can see and can report these issues in real time, and I know these things to be issues, 
and yet the what you hear publicly about the app is like everyone download the app and we'll all be able to go outside. ScoMo described it as um, sunscreen for mm. for for uh, a post COVID world, and maybe he was just you know like sort of like trying to play it safe and hoping for the best case scenario. But it feels like these are critiques we we as a podcast as a completely uninformed bunch of dudes made at the time contemporaneously. Yeah. You can go back and listen to the episodes, and they're proven to be true. Um, mm. specifically around iPhone usage and locking and active and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Like, so yeah, for I them to... I they figured that they'd, they'd patch it. Like maybe we'll roll out a defunct program. And that was my as hope as well. It, that, that they'll just fix it. But... Once it's out there, once it's on people's phones, then you can push updates. Day one DLC um, for, for all the video gamers out there. I definitely <laughs> understand that. And like, yeah, as I said, it was one of so many straws that they were grasping at, but it, it does seem... Um, like initially dishonest and the fact that we've just sort of like quietly backed away from it like homer simpson into so many hedges seems <laughs> like a, a bit uh not not hypocritical but like it seems a bit rich from this government to be to have been spruiking it so hard and then to have backed away from it you know like i don't know it seems seems a bit rich it's uh yeah i mean from my ivory tower over here i'll be cutting down as many tall poppies as mm-hmm. i can thank you very much um it's been interesting because while this COVID spike's been going on, like there's heaps of other stuff happening in the news that like we haven't even um, touched on and it sort of gets swept under the rug. Like mm. I was saying to you before the show that, um, you know, there's a, a Victorian government minister that's been accused of branch stacking and all this other stuff that normally would be... It's not even be... like top 10 stuff right now, honestly. No, nah, like... it's like, who cares, man? Like I don't, I don't want to, you know, infect my family. Like that's everyone's main focus. Um you know, well, the arts. Not not everyone's main focus. Clearly the person who tested positive <laughs> for COVID-19 and then went to a family gathering infecting 11 of his own relatives. Um, obviously, it wasn't chief amongst his concerns, but... No, it's, no, it's good. It's all good. Yeah, I don't know whether, you know, I haven't, don't know too much about the individual cases that are occurring in Victoria, mm. but God damn it, I want to go on a holiday up to bloody the New South Wales coast or something, but I can't because the borders are closed. Again. I think um, Kamal Nanjiani, um, his tweet about this was was probably the best that I've seen so far. And he goes, okay, so let me um, let me just get this straight. So the reason that we've um, that we stopped fighting the pandemic was because checks notes we got bored of it. <laughs> like, <laughs> it feels a bit like that. It's like we it? just kind of stopped giving a shit about it, and we're like, oh well, some people got to die. I guess I, I need to go to the movies again. So it is it is unfathomable. Like just to think about what what is the cost of a human life and you know for a some lot less than we some, thought apparently <laughs> for some countries you know it's uh, tens of thousands of dollars uh, dollars tens of thousands of people mm. um you know uh, uh, that they uh, those are described as acceptable casualties i guess in the 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 mentality of the mob the uh, the problem is it's like the pandemic is a perfect sort of like tragedy of the commons Right, because like everyone behaving in their own selfish best interest thinks that they're not going to be affected. It's not going to happen to me, or if I get sick, I won't be the one who dies. And everyone's walking around with this sense of entitlement, and so everyone behaves in ways that are selfish and suit them, and thus we all suffer as a result. Because rather than suppressing it to the point where we could make the disease extinct potentially, and then things just go back to normal, like normal, normal, mm. um, we're chasing after a dozen, two dozen cases, which could become 40 cases, which could become 80 cases. And then we're back in the same situation again. It's like, you just got those fringe group of people who's acting really selfishly. And then all the sacrifices that we, the rest of us yeah. have made for the last three, four months, just completely go by the wayside. Like either selfishly though, or, or just ignorantly, um, is probably another potential sort of situation where, where they're not really following what's going on again. I'm not really sure. Be honest, I, I think I do think part, part of it is like it. news fatigue as well. It's just like people yeah. are sick of it and they just want things to go back to normal. And I definitely understand watch the that. Footy, man, just want to watch the footy. I know? saw this interview um, with a guy in Broadmeadows, which is one of the areas in Victoria here in Australia that uh, is uh, suffering a, a spike in cases right now. And he goes, oh, "Bro, I've got a I've got a business to run." You know, like I can't keep mucking around with this bloody the bloody COVID or get a get a cough. I got a got a business to run, and it's like, oh yeah, mate, that's super important that you go out and sell fucking Twizzlers, 
you know, like it's, I don't know. It just, it, it seems to me as though the, the, uh, and like, I'm not making fun of people's economic pain, right? Like both me and my partner are out of a job as a direct result yeah. of this. Like I understand there's real economic pain that's happening as a result of this, but like to my mind, it's like, why not go hard sooner yeah, and then get rid of it and then like put the worst of the economic pain behind us and then we can properly sure get back to opening up. Loving life right now, aren't they? And they went hard early. I remember, and, um, um, yeah, they they were bordering on extermination of the of the virus altogether. But I think there might have been some new cases recently. I haven't been following that closely. Um, regardless, Victorians are not going anywhere because we're the ones with all the new cases currently. So, lock it down. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, New Zealand's got a couple of um, cases, but they're like four, two. You know, um, nothing huge. But yeah, anyway. So anyway, the world goes on. Uh, as it were, and uh, some explosive news came out this week mm. uh, from uh, the New York Times, was it? Yeah. Um, around uh, a bit of a bit of foreign espionage, shall we say? So, anyone who knows me knows that I love anything to do with the Soviet Union and spies and Cold War shit and active measures. And this this is a story. For the whole family. It's got a bit of everything oh, for everyone. Great. I could see Tom, definitely... Tom Cruise starring in this. <laughs> it's funny. I, I I read this and was like, oh, the writers of Homeland nailed it again. So mm-hmm. if you've seen the last season of Homeland, you'll be like, that's kind of what happened in that show. Not not exactly, but but there are similarities. It's, it's um, interesting. Uh, I think uh, if they keep prognosticating in this manner, they're going to start getting pulled in by the cops. <laughs> like... <laughs> uh, so what do you guys um, know that we don't um, <laughs> so a report from the New York Times from June 26 um, says American intelligence officials have concluded that a Russian military intelligence unit secretly offered bounties to Taliban linked militants for killing coalition forces in Afghanistan targeting uh, American troops uh, amid the peace talks to end the long running war there according to officials briefed on the matter so uh, this was a during the period uh, where uh, in 2019, where America was negotiating with the Taliban to try and come to some sort of peaceful accord. Uh, and they, it seems like from, from my understanding of the situation that if Russia is sponsoring violence, if that does seem to be true, then the point would be to put American negotiators in a weaker position um, in that agreement. So, yeah. not yeah, only truly try to derail the peace process to try and keep people to keep to keep the war going, which inherently is you know creating instability in a foreign adversary, basically. Yeah. Um. um so they uh concluded that they had uh, covertly uh, offered rewards for successful attacks last year. So those they believe those bounties have been paid. So which would suggest that. Americans were killed in combat and there was... There were only 20 people, I think, killed... uh, 20 Americans killed, sorry, last year, I believe. Correct. So it's not clear exactly which killings were under suspicion to being linked to that, but um, but certainly the the allegation is that some of them were. Um, And I think... Like, imagine if you're the family of one of these soldiers who died in this conflict to think that a foreign actor wasn't wasn't just like maliciously pursuing, you know, American interests, and your son happened to be killed. But like, <laughs> but militants were like financially incentivized to like to kill to, yeah. to kill your son or to kill your brother or husband or whatever it is. Like, it yeah. just seems like so beyond the pale of yeah. what you know non cynical good actors do in a conflict. Like, it's but it it, it makes sense in some ways though, because I mean you think about the Russians in Afghanistan 40 years ago or whatever, mm. um, or 30 years ago, however long it was ago. Um, I mean, we were, the Americans were giving the Taliban, you know, stinger missiles and, you know, other financial rewards for, for helping their effort, mm. uh, which ultimately were successful. So it's kind of like the Russians are real. And, it, oh, you know, that- I'd assume the Russians have been meddling uh, for years. The CIA know. was like famous for having trained Osama bin Laden during that conflict yeah. as one of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. And, and obviously um, for anyone who's a student of history, that didn't work out too well for them, but 
nailed it. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's, it's 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 like it's, well, the, I, for me, I don't think the scandal is that it happened. The scandal is that the president was briefed on it in March and has taken no subsequent action against Russia in the intervening time. Yeah. Like he was, so what they do after something like this is you get a confidential briefing from uh, the security services as the president and they give you a menu of options. They say you could try the foie gras, you could have the filet mignon. Uh, have you tried the uh, cruise missile strike? Yes, uh, it's a delightful strike, this time of year, very in season. Uh, mm. And uh, on this occasion in late March, when Trump was briefed, he elected to do uh, brrr, nothing, nothing whatsoever. I mean, it, it's, uh, I don't know. It, it's interesting. I, John Bolton's um, claims this week, who has just been, I love a good tell-all. John been saying, Bolton has been the messiest bitch. Now that his book bitch. is out, now that he's collected his $2 million advance, now he's happy to spill. Meanwhile, he when they were wanting score. to wanting him to testify during the impeachment hearings, there was a John Bolton sized hole in the wall where he should have been. And he goes, "Yeah, if you if you compel me to testify, I'll testify." And they're like, "Why don't you just testify?" And he goes, "I've got to deal with Simon and Schuster going. I'll I'll tell you guys <laughs> next year, past the point where it makes any fucking difference whatsoever." Thanks, John. It's yeah. Look and look, John Bolton is a, a bit of a. a you know, waskily wabbit. I mean, he's been involved in what three administrations now. Um, you Just know, going from strength he, to strength. He was one of the architects of the war in Iraq and that kind of thing. But um, he's a seasoned foreign policy, you know, uh, player, if you will. And if he, a right wing, you know, conservative foreign policy um, expert, is if he is turning around and saying, "Nah, Trump's." A lunatic. Um, he said he was inept. He was he was not uh, capable of 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 uh, successfully or... occupying that office. Like, yeah, I don't know why all these of... people go for work, go to work for this guy. Who they? It seems like multiple, multiple people have come out of this administration with this exact same story. Like, yeah, guys are fucking loose cannon, reckless cunt. Like, worked for him for nine years. Like, <laughs> it's like <laughs> why? Why everyone thinks that they're the adult in the room? But at a certain mm. point, you're just enabling this maniac. And by not coming out at the time and sounding the alarm and be being yeah. the whistleblower that says, hey, shit's fucked up. This guy is not capable of running the country. By waiting yeah. a, a, you know, nine months for your book to be published, you're not serving anyone's interests but your own. Mm. Like, and, and I guess I guess my point with John Bolton is, apart from the... His, his point was, was that Trump isn't necessarily he's not playing any games because he's just not playing he's not doing anything he's just he's self-interested mm. so my thing rather than it being any because everyone's now questioning whether or not you know and the whole thing with the whole russian influence back in 2016 was mm. that you know putin and trump have some sort of relationship or there's john, some sort john of, bolton coercion, said, right? john bolton said that he believed russia did exert some undue influence during the 2016 election now he wouldn't go so far as to comment as to whether, um, you know, the Trump campaign necessarily knew about it, but like he's admitting the facts as we understand them. Like mm. they got help from the Russians, and then he went and worked in that administration. Like, bro, where are your principles? Like, I guess the thing is, like, it's kind of like the House of Cards thing as well, where there's sort of this romantic fetishization around uh, working in the White House. Mm. So you'll do whatever it takes to work in the White House. Mm. Um, it's an honour to work in the White House, even if you're working for a literal unit, lunatic, which is mm. the whole... That's literally the plot of House of Cards, right? Mm. Um, and just which, the acquisition despite, of power at all costs. Yeah, and despite Kevin Spacey being a, a you know bit of a bad dude... Um, to put it mildly. That show, I think, still... you know, There's a lot of truths in that, in which mm. can be lined up with the current administration for, for certain things. It um, did um, sort of remind me, like, it does sound like exactly the sort of thing that Russia would do. Like, yeah. the, these active measures, that, you know, the the misinformation campaign that we're already familiar with during the 2016 election. And, and I think it's ongoing. I think you'll see stuff around the Black Lives Matters protests yeah. and fermenting discord along those same lines as well, especially leading up to an election. Um, it's what, what the Russians call active measures, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a term, uh, so I'll, I want to give people the, 
like the actual understanding of what it is. So, bit of, uh, bit of espionage. Yeah, uh, it's it's a term for the actions knowledge. of political warfare, um, particularly conducted by the Soviet and Russian security services to influence the course of world events. So these can be things from media manipulations to um, assassinations, um, misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, counterfeiting official documents, uh, political repression. Um, in Russia, famously, they've got a bunch of like opposition parties, um, several of which are believed to be propped up by Vladimir Putin himself in for order the to, for the of, appearance of some yeah. kind of viable opposition party. Um, and so you'll have opposition parties going after other opposition parties saying like, oh, you're just here as like, um, as a, what's the word for it? Not, not like a false flag operation, but like you're, you're here as a, a conspirator or something. Yeah. As, as like a co-conspirator, like a, yeah, a way of for a stooge. Yeah. A stooge, stooge or a patsy, patsy yeah. something like that. Yeah. You're, you're here as, as Putin's yeah. patsy to give the appearance of an opposition party when it's actually funded and directed at Putin's behest as mm. well. So these are the sorts of things that the, the Russian government, formerly the Soviet Union, are like known for doing. And they're um, good at it. They're really good at it. Like the yeah. co- kompromat is a Russian word, which means to the Russian act of like getting material to sort of compromise What's or blackmail someone. someone. Yeah. Like this was what they have been doing since the 20s. Um, a former, there's a great Oleg Kalugin, a uh, former head of foreign counterintelligence for the KGB from 73 to 79, described active measure- measures as, quote, the heart and soul of Soviet intelligence. Quote, not intelligence collection, but subversion. Active measures to weaken the West, to drive wedges in the Western community alliance of all sorts, particularly NATO, which is important. We'll come back to that in a sec. Uh, mm. To sow discord amongst allies, to weaken the United States in the eyes of the people of Europe, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and thus to prepare ground in case the war really occurs. And if you look at Putin and you look at Putin's history and where he came from, he was a KGB operative back in the day. Uh, yep. station chief rose to political power um, in the sort of dismantling of the Soviet Union and thought it was, he's described it as like the greatest crime of the 20th century. You see him wanting to hearken back to an era where the Soviet Union was together and these tactics were consistently employed. Yeah. So for him to undermine the West in this way would be completely unsurprising. I mean, and it's worked. I mean, you look at, they've got Trump in power and you know, you look at, for instance, he is Trump is weakening the NATO alliance. Mm-hmm. You know, they're pulling troops out of Europe. Um, there's questions about whether or not they should financially support certain things within the NATO alliance. So, for, for all intents and purposes, Russia's their operations, um, even if they're only little things, you know, they've paid off in the long run. Mm-hmm. It's and um, and to my mind, like that's the biggest the real crisis of the Trump presidency. And it's sort of like whether he's, whether Trump is doing it at Putin's behest or because he's an isolationist moron, it doesn't really matter. Like it doesn't, it's it, to my mind, it's a distinction without a difference. Putin gets what he wants. So either way. So like Trump's complicity in the matter is almost irrelevant. Like either you're a useful idiot, again, another Russian term, where you're so useless at your job and so uninterested and deeply uncurious as a person that you have no idea what the Western Alliance is or its value and you're just an idiot and that's why you're dismantling it or you're a literal Putin patsy stooge yeah. and you're dismantling it for that reason. Like either way, the effect is the same. So it doesn't really from, matter from, to me. From John Bolton's comments uh, this week and last week, I, I would suspect that it's probably the former, that he's just someone who's so self-interested and ill prepared for the job that it's, it's uh, the use, the useful idiot as it were. They ca- they um, keep saying John Bolton said that everything that he does is to get sort of reelected. That's, that's the plan. But then earlier this week, like, his administration filed a brief with the Supreme Court to try and get Obamacare removed in the middle of a pandemic. I'm like, bro, are you trying to win? Like, are you trying to win at this stage? Because it doesn't seem to me that he even, like, do you even want to be president anymore? I think he can't just be like, I think winners, I think he thinks winners are two-term presidents. Like, you're not a winner if you're a one-term president, like Gerald Ford. He's specifically made allusions to Gerald Ford in the past as being a, a bit of a loser. Yeah. And... But I don't think he like he doesn't like the job of governing. He just wants to have win, he, have won, yeah. if that yeah. makes sense. 
Because like clearly yeah. his response during the coronavirus pandemic, his like he's just a bad, lazy, terrible president who really yeah. wants to be president just to say he won the presidency again rather than actually doing the, any of the job of governing. Like, And that, and that as we said, plays into Russia's hands. Um, and an example of that might be, depending on which way you look at it, mm. uh, be his calls uh, for Russia and China to come back, or for, it's Russia, isn't it? He wants Russia. To, yeah, uh, to come back to the, to the G7 uh, table. Yeah, so this is the future with China. This is an article from the New York Times from Maggie Haberman, famous political reporter, from May thirtieth of this year, and it just made me think when I read we read that what we just read about where Russia was secretly offering bounties to to kill U.S. troops, um, and, and made me think, okay, well that briefing was in March mm. for activities that were conducted in twenty nineteen, so. Trump's call, it just reminded me of this article from May 30, which was discussing Trump calling for Russia to be reincorporated back into the G7, making it the G8 again. And I was like, wait, that would have been after he received this briefing, if it's yeah. true that he received this briefing from intelligence officials. Uh -huh. That would have been this, this article here, where he calls for Russia to be reincorporated into this union would have occurred after he received that briefing. So not only did they not take any diplomatic action against Russia, no sanctions, no cruise missiles. Wasn't even announced. Wasn't, wasn't even announced. Wasn't he hid it from the American people. He then publicly was calling for troops to be pulled out of Germany, for Russia to, to rejoin the G7. Uh, and, and it just seems to me Pretty. like... It, the conspiracy like, theorist in George's head is lining up. It just seems like so suspicious, doesn't it? Like if you've it just had sense. a private briefing of a country acting in such a negative, covert way against your country, would you be publicly calling for them to be to get back in the club? Like it just doesn't make sense I mean, to me. The flip side is, I mean, the context in which he made that was he was literally on Air Force One just making some offhand comments to journalists. So like take that with a grain of salt yeah but why is that even um, on his radar after all well, of this you know what i mean yeah. like the, nothing's on his radar do you know what i mean he just says mm. stuff he also said that um he wants i think it was was australia india and um uh south korea um mm. and he said uh it's a nice group of countries right there <laughs> and he at the time he did invite scott morrison to come to the to the table and uh perhaps attend one of these summits and look he does have a point in the sense that if you're going to actually successfully conduct world diplomacy, you kind of need to have, you don't want to have, the UN's probably got too many players in some ways because you can't actually get anything done. But sure. you do need more than like a core group of seven people. Do you know what I mean? You need, you need to have, in some ways, cooperation uh, amongst a number of players. You can't, so in that, politically, in terms of that, uh, in terms of the effect, it would have um, in terms of perhaps um, pressuring China, which was why he made that statement. You know what we need? Yeah. We need we need to get China involved. We need India involved. We need, you know, to contain China, we need some kind of trans-Pacific partnership. <laughs> oh, I dismantled that? That was me? Oh, that was me. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, Russia, I think it's had one of the largest military exercises ever conducted with China on their border so you know as to how frisky uh, the chinese are with with the russians i'm not particularly sure i, I don't know whether or not they would uh necessarily buy into you know uh pressuring them um from from one particular angle but don't let's yeah, not I... forget by the way that the reason that uh russia was excluded from the g8 making it the g7 is because they annexed another fucking country like, it's not because yeah. they were just like, oh, just being a bit naughty. Like, oh, just with you. Just a couple of trade sanctions. Just a just couple of trade, yeah, a bit of a trade war. No, nothing like that. They literally took another piece of another <laughs> fucking country <laughs> being Crimea. And then Me. everyone was like, you can't you can't be in the big boys club if you're going to start taking up territory. It's not the 1900s, bro. You can't do that anymore. Like, yeah. the, the, the reason that they're out is because they're, they've been specifically bad actors. Um, yeah. For yeah. for an extended period of time, it's not as yeah. though it's like some personal beef or like some, 
you know, like a vendetta from the intelligence community against Russia that's completely baseless, like it's just Cold War hysteria rearing its ugly head again. No, it's like you you were bad at things and you need to be punished. You, you, yeah. You've done bad Not, things in the world. Yeah. Not to mention, yeah, I mean, the whole Ukrainian war was, yeah, that was sponsored by, by Russia. Um, MH17 was shot down by a, right. a missile that was from Russia and that was may not have bad, the Russian officers may not have pressed the button, but they were sitting at the back there going, Hey man, let's, um, I'm going to train you how to use it badly. Um, obviously not well enough. Yeah. You know, there's also been the assassination attempts in, in Britain and and that kind of thing. And there's a whole bunch of stuff we don't even know about obviously as well. Mm. So yeah, you're right. Um, in terms of the international, uh, community they're not necessarily acting in in good faith it's funny though one thing i do find strange is that amongst all this the russian and u.s space programs have kept going throughout this entire time yeah, right? everybody loves space everyone loves space um it's see those rockets what, what it's will... like a big metal penis shooting into oh, the sky just... vagina gets me um gets me uh going every time mm-hmm. uh but it'll be interesting to see now that we've got the americans have successfully sort of at least started their um uh private corporate space program i come with the uh, crude space program mm. whether or not that relationship which was initially something that they were it was you know a common ground whether or not that will now start to be impacted i wonder um, if it's just like to. just a like a rate of return thing it's like both sides just have so much invested at this point that to, to pull out would harm both well of them. yeah well both of them have a lot tied up in the international space station so that's what i mean yeah um but I don't know. I don't know if you know what you can do about any of this. It's just uh, the international stage. You know, uh, it's the the the, the merry merry go round of international politics and espionage. As as to it continues. as to what we can do about it. Yeah, I, I really have no idea. But I feel like it does get sort of short shrift in the media. Like we're not talking about. Yeah, like it's a huge story, yeah. and it'll be in the news cycle for one day, a day. and yeah. it'll be gone. And so. Because yeah. you can throw as much mud as you want, but there's two two aspects of it. One mm. is mud doesn't stick to Trump, mm. and the second thing is Teflon um, done. Uh, you know, uh, a larger explosion snuffs out the oxygen, and the larger explosion in this case being the explosion of coronavirus in the US and Brazil, um, yeah. and other countries as well. So, yeah, it's a shitty situation. But uh, good to know. And look, if you've seen Homeland Season 8, mm-hmm. uh, or in fact, just watch Homeland because it goes through a lot of this stuff and it did, it does so and has done. When they, each time they released a season, it was sort of... Prescient. Either in, yeah, it was very prescient. Mm. Um, the latest season's about essentially the war in Afghanistan and the, the, the attempts of, of the Americans to try and get a, a peace process. The president mm. in charge is not exactly a particularly um, good president, mm-hmm. and uh, there are, there are other outside influences, namely Pakistan and Russia, that would seem to profit off an ongoing uh, war rather than one that's ended. I haven't seen that season, but my read on Homeland has been, you know, throughout the seasons that it's it's been a um, a surprisingly adept read of the current state of geopolitics in various different situations. It's like the first couple of seasons are like sort of a bit of a love story. And then from then onwards, like from season three onwards, it actually gets really good in sort of delving into like, here is a serious political geopolitical issue issue that we're going to sort of dive into. And you see all the dynamics at play and it's sort of silly to say like it's informed um, it makes you think about politics things. but like it is yeah. one thing to like to understand something to read it in the newspaper and to like to see characters in that world in the setting and see how the relationships between the intelligence agencies and the governments actually look to see it is it just makes it feel a lot more tangible to my yeah. mind um and so sort of, it is fiction we have to be clear it is fiction it but is fiction but they it base is, it around yeah. current like you know real Terrible. groups real interests real you know real kinds of dynamics that are are actually present in the world it's not yeah. you know it is made up but it is informed by things that are actually happening in the world and you could say oh okay i see how that 
dynamic works in Pakistan now between the, yeah. you know, the, um, you know, the terrorists and the intelligence service. And like, I could see how that works and how it makes sense. And, uh, but don't worry, Car- you can solve everything with Carrie Matheson just going off her meds. She needs to go uh, off her meds, man. Let's go off her meds, She's got to get off her meds in order to, I got to see the full picture, man. That's the, um, got to get the, the, bat- the cork board and the red thread out. And Carrie's going to solve it all, mate, just because she's, you know, fucking high off not medication. <laughs> I, um, that's, that, that's the one plot flaw that I can't deal with in that uh, yeah i can't deal with there, um carrie matheson's yeah, ugly crying that's it really does not do it for me but no it's more about um the way they solve each situation is or the way they create create dramatic tension sometimes mm. it's just I guess carrie's going off her meds just to make something interesting happen. yeah she's like and uh, she's having an existential crisis and she's going to drink a whole bottle of vodka and fuck some guy okay that's got to happen like two to three times a season to keep it interesting but um apart from that Great show. Great show. I <laughs> love it. It's, um, it's one of my favorites. Uh, just like this show. Great mm-hmm. show. Uh, is that is that all we've got to uh, rag on today? I think it's probably covered I think so. our uh, little little uh, collection of stories. Um, but there is, yeah. I think the, the thrust of this show is that while the, the, the wave keeps coming of coronavirus, there is there are things happening elsewhere in the world, um, whether that be Australian government announcements for, for funding that, for the arts that doesn't make sense or whether mm-hmm. it be an app that doesn't work or whatever it may be um, or international espionage, uh, it pays to pay a closer attention to the news to keep informed um, and not to get stuck in a black hole. Otherwise, mm-hmm. if we don't hold governments to account, uh, we'll be, you know, we'll end up like some of these dictatorships we talk about mm-hmm. sooner rather than later. Yeah, no, it's important to not get lost in the fire hose of information. I think that's probably why we're zeroing in a little bit more on, on stories on this show. It's because like, okay, we want to talk about this in some depth rather than just like whizzing by 10 different stories. Because like each one of them could like yeah. by rights deserve an episode by yeah. itself, but we just don't have the bandwidth for that. That's the problem is that um, so much of the news, especially in the last couple of years, has become... Um, very, a very fire similar. hose is a yeah. good, is a good expression. I a fire, you're trying just... to drink from a fire hose, and it's just not palatable. So I'd rather, no. uh, you know, focus on one story in some depth and give you a bit of the background on it, and mm. hopefully some jokes find themselves along the way. Somewhere along there, but look, next week I'll try and find a silly, silly story for everyone to enjoy as, as a palate cleanser. Yeah, just and... like a you know pelican that becomes friends with a kitten or something. You know, it's yeah, just... something like that, or you know, um, someone skydive naked, or I don't know. We'll find yeah. something. We'll find. Yeah. It's, it's sometimes it helps to uh, it uh, helps to to sort of set the search parameters for what you want to find, and then just let Google do the heavy lifting. That's what we all need to do. Give uh, in to the algorithm. Fra- give in. <laughs> give in to the algorithm. <laughs> the algorithm. <laughs> Um, and a friend of the show, Andrew, is writing in. Adam looks like a gaming influencer. I think he's talking about the pixelization of your high quality webcam there. Oh, it's a HD my HD webcam that's two point one megapixels. HD webcam is not a brand. <laughs> it's a product according to nope. the software device. <laughs> what, what defines HD? It's not important. Anyway, I, thanks for listening, uh, guys. On that note, we have been, we are, we always will be our natural selection. Make sure you visit us at our salubrious home on the web, our natural show. Dot com. Make sure you follow us on all the social medias that have, do, or ever will exist at Unnatural Show. That's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at George Tsipos, where I'm making some uh, some fun little YouTube videos that are definitely worth checking out. Content. Um, content. So much content along the same sort of lines as the stuff we talk about here on the show, but yeah, diving in a little bit more and um, and obviously in video format. Um, Without our voices to break it up, so you have to be prepared for that. Yeah, it's just eight Hard straight stuff. minutes of George, straight straight to your brain. Um, no, but there's cool graphics and things like that. So it, it's uh, yeah, I've, I've figured out how to use my editing system quite well. So it looks looks quite fun. Um, make sure you follow Adam on your social media at uh, AC Doreen. And make sure you follow. Give give Tom a, a pity follow because he's laid up in bed and re- recovering from his marathon gaming sesh. Should we give, at... should we give Tom some, some golf claps? Yeah. Make sure you follow him at Tom D. Heath. Um, I don't know if I said our website. It's unnaturalshow.com. 
visit us there for things and stuff. Uh, we love your faces. Thanks for listening, and we'll uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Uh huh. We'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow. T- uh, what? I, I don't know why I said that. We'll see you in the next episode. I guess <laughs> you'll you'll see us. Are you gonna do an episode without me? Is that what's just, gonna yes by myself? It's just me yelling into the void for forty five minutes. That's the plan. Still change the name of the show. Should mm-hmm. do it. Screaming into the void at George Sipos. It's not with George Sipos, just George Sipos screaming into the void. And there's a picture of me screaming. Yeah. (laughs) Thanks for listening, guys. We'll see you next week.